So last lecture, I think uh, uh, what we were doing was uh, class network. And that particular condition was for unicast condition, okay, not for multicasting. So in fact, after that, I went back and then searched into the literature. I figured out it's still an unresolved issue, unresolved problem. Pending and still people have been investigating this thing, how to figure out the bounds. Uh, but I could actually sit down the, uh, yesterday night and could actually figure out certain insights. And from there, I can actually build up a bound, but I think this can be further improved a lot. And there is also a classification which also has to further come in. So I think multicasting in multi-stage interconnection switching networks is still an open area, open field, which needs a lot of investigation. And uh, I think the one of the best reference will be that uh, one of the gentlemen whose paper actually has been up already uploaded from Taiwan, who actually has written a book only on multicast interconnection, multi multicast, multi-stage interconnection networks. So whatever I actually have done yesterday night, so there is something new which is not there in my notes. So it's a new addition. And for last eight nine years, I was actually teaching incorrectly <laughs> this particular portion. portion. And no student has actually has ever told me that I am teaching it incorrect. They should have figured it out that it is incorrect. So, but it just stuck to me while teaching in the previous class. This happens once in a while. So, and I always get excited when this happens. <laughs> so, coming back to the same class configuration. And remember, it's all argumentative. I am not doing any mathematics but can be done through pulse matrix. But pulse matrix is not a good approach, which I also figured out while reading the paper by John Turner. Okay, there is also one paper uh, which is also loaded inside from him. Okay. Uh, there is an alternative approach for doing this. I will just give an idea and leave it. I think you people have to do your own investigations because it's open-ended research now. Okay, so this is the situation and so far what we know is you have R3, you have R1. I am just keeping the same notations which I have been using. I am not using the notations which are used in the paper. They use a different notation. Okay, so you have to be careful while you are reading the paper because you will, I also got confused. You will, chances are that you will also get confused. Uh, but I think with some practice you will be able to appreciate that. So N3 outputs, M1 inputs, R3 switches. So clause theorem actually simply says that for a unicast connection, because if you make only one connection, so M minus, M1 minus 1, in worst case, these many are occupied. One is left out, which has to be connected. This would have occupied all these lines. So in fact, we call this thing as a unicast is a special case of multicast where fan out is one. Now what is a fan out F, F vector? Uh, this I have not introduced earlier. So fan out actually says that what will be the total maximum size which is permitted for a multicast group, the output ports. So because I am only permitting only one output port to be connected to input port, F is equal to one. I think a case, I can take a case of f is equal to 2 also, where only two output connections are permitted. Now this f factor will actually play a role in figuring out what will be the hardware requirement. When f is equal to, see all possible nodes can be connected. Uh, now you have to look at there is going to be somewhere an optimization. If I have to connect all the output ports to one port, any switch will work, okay. Any switch will work. So far, this R3 will become equal to uh, M1. That is good enough. So you have reduced this number of elements. But if you start making it one, the extreme case on the other side is going to be M1 plus N3 minus one. That's the one case when F is equal to one. And if I take a fan out case of when f is equal to 
R3 into N3. Then you require only R2. Here R2 has to be greater than or equal to this here R2 will be greater than or equal to how much? Any node you should be able to connect. R2 should be equal to M1 N3 maximum of this under this condition which is obvious I think intuitively you can figure it out. The problem happens in between and I also don't know I am not going to do that I am just going to give my estimate at least if you have whatever I am saying equal to or higher than that it will be strictly non-blocking. Okay. Anything lower that I cannot say there is a possibility you can actually have a strictly non-blocking but I don't know the proof. Well, that again is has to be worked out. Now, uh, I am also now going to add one more definition. Earlier I have only told you strictly non-blocking. So there is something called, because this also term has been very extensively used and our, I also figured out that even for class network, algorithms are available which will make it wide sense non-blocking and it requires less hardware. Okay, there has been again lot of proofs on that. So I have defined a strictly non-blocking earlier and I think it's a good idea that if we separate out a strictly non-blocking for unicast and a strictly non-blocking for multicast, two definitions should be separate always. Same is true for wide sense non-blocking. So wide sense non-blocking there will be certain connections which have to be done between input and output. Okay. If already some connections have been done and you want to do a new one. Okay you cannot be, you may not be able to do the connection. It's a blocking in that sense. But if it is strict non-blocking, you can always make the connections without bothering about the earlier connections. But take a case, when it is possible to know all IO maps and circuit is, uh, you know all connections. So input I1 to some output something, so I to O map is known to you already. And all connections are torn apart. None of them are connected and you are able to invent an algorithm by which you can pick up connections in certain order and they are set up as per certain pattern. If this algorithm you can invent and if that algorithm is used you can always set up all possible IO map combinations. If that is possible that technically means you are avoiding certain switch states and switch will be always non-blocking. You can set up all possible permutation combinations of input to output only if you are following certain algorithm. For screen on blocking you do not need any algorithm. Any kind of map which is there, IO is free, you can always set up the connection. But here you require an algorithm, that is the only condition. And rearrangeably non blocking, even if you, you cannot build up an algorithm of this kind, you might have to now decide on rearrangements. That, that, that will not be that used, not that will not be used. Random routing is for that. That was only for finding out, estimating the blocking probability. Here I am not, I am trying to find out the characteristic of interconnection network. Okay. So that is wide sense non-blocking, this I think is the good way of defining. If you have an algorithm, so I do one by one every connection and based on the connection, I will choose an algorithm to set up and this algorithm will ensure it will be always non-blocking. You cannot just simply pick up anything which is free and set up a connection. So what is the actual difference between the white sense non-blocking and the rearrangeable non-blocking? Rearrangeable non-blocking is, okay, uh, I think let me elaborate on this. You have this, some switch, I am giving an example, they are only 4 by 4. Okay, how it is done inside, don't worry about it. So there is 1, 2, 3 and 4, I am giving you 4 scenarios. So I have created some map say let me put primes, 2 to 3 prime, 4 to 1 prime, okay. These are the two connections which are already set up. Now without bothering about, without disturbing these, if I can set up say any combination, so now what is left is 1 and 3 and what is left on this side is 2 prime and 4 prime. 
any possible combination i can take there are 2 into 2 total 4 combinations which are possible okay so it can be 1 4 if it's a unicast thing i can always set up this thing without disturbing this that's a strictly non blocking okay whatever way this connection has been set up this this connection also can be set up in this switch in multiple different ways with the multiple possibilities multiple switch states are there but if i build up an algorithm when i am setting up these paths i follow that algorithm to avoid certain states of the switch and now when this connection request comes in when i set up because i am avoiding certain switch states i will have to set up these that's a white sense non blocking i have to follow an algorithm now rearrange i am not doing any rearrangement when they were set up at that time i followed an algorithm which is permitting me to maintain this as strictly non blocking now if i dismantle all these connections and then i can always find out a combination that all maps can be done that's a rearrangeably non blocking you can follow in less hardware white sense non blocking requires slightly more always white sense non blocking requires more amount of hardware than rearrangeable non blocking but where as you are setting up connections you are following a certain algorithm that what we call a switch engineer's thumb rule rule of thumb is that try to push the connection towards the heavily loaded side as far as possible okay if it's not possible then go to the least loaded side in the network and you will minimize on the blocking probability now that's a rule which you are following if you don't follow the rule you might end up in blocking how can you get it make a venn diagram of this the game and blocking and white sense blocking there now this actually white sense non blocking i will give an example then you will understand later on you okay what you are saying he is saying there is a if there is a blocking network if you look in terms of switches all switches by default uh, set of all switches and if you look in terms there will be a blocking uh, switches within blocking there will be Uh, this is what we call blocking in the sense you cannot set up without disturbing or with disturbing it all depends on that now making a venn diagram sir if you see as per the hardware requirement the minimum requirement is of rearrangement after that comes white sense after that comes friction so that way sir it is it's a concentric circle with the uh, smallest venn diagram being same sense then white sense nahi whether the blocking all blocking will get encompassed by by this no blocking is a separate set all together yeah, blocking will be separate set. if there is a strictly non blocking thing with white sense will be a small part of it the smallest will be strict sense then okay. will be white sense and the maximum will be real sense right if we see hardware is of this is hardware sir dns should be the most part hardware is hardware is of hardware no no not minimum i am talking about all these thing you need don't do any rearrangement you don't do any rearrangement or do a rearrangement is actually the rearrangement <laughs> rearrangement of zero entities so this is also rearrangeable non blocking in that sense you don't avoid certain states that as good as avoiding certain states so this also becomes subset of white sense only thing addition thing which is coming here is avoiding certain states here you are not avoiding and here you further now you are able to do the rearrangements here you are not doing rearrangements not doing rearrangements plus doing rearrangements is equal to doing rearrangements is like this so in that sense i think this should be okay right it has to figure out what's the current state and what new has to be set up and based on that usually the new connection when you want to set up can lead to more than one few many states
So you have to choose one of those states, which one you have to choose will be given by the algorithm. So you have to avoid certain states so that you should not end up in blocking states. Well, that's basically is the idea. No, it all depends on the switch design. So once we will do it at some point for five stage, then you will appreciate that. Okay. So that I will do later on once I finish up with the Cantor network after that. Hmm? There is no blocking in any switch here because this no these ports are more than this. Only blocking is because of interconnection. Not switches are all strictly non blocking, they are crossbars. Or if you want to implement them, we are assuming that you are recursively making them also by three stage network which is strictly non blocking. If you want to maintain them a strictly non blocking switch. Okay. And if it is a rearrangeable non blocking, each block should be further can be implemented by a three stage rearrangeable non blocking switch. You have to ensure that. So you can keep on doing it till you come to the fundamental element. So it will not be three stages, but technically it will be more number, large number of stages. But it's a cascade, recursive construction. Okay, we'll come to that later on, so that we can estimate the cross point complexity. So this one is pretty simple. What I did, I am doing now for f fan out f is general. Switch is this. So I will assume this is the one input which has to go to f outputs. If all f outputs are one single switch, life is very simple. I have to just simply route only one and then this will do the fan out. Fan out happens in third stage. Okay. Fan out also can happen in first stage because I can do a fan out here and then this can do the fan out. That's also possible. I am not taking that case as, as of now. I am looking at worst case scenario. So there m minus 1, m1 minus 1, these are occupied, only one is free, which has to be routed to somewhere. Now, these are occupied switches. I require some free switch to connect to the f possibilities. And f fan outs are going to happen at this point, at this point, at this point. So I am assuming that f is less than R3. f is going to be less than R3, less than or equal to R3. The moment f is greater than or equal to R3, I will simply take R3 as the fan out. Now that's very important. So this comes condition between minimum of the two kind of thing will come. Now this particular switch I can assume that N3 minus 1 are occupied and they are connecting to the middle stage switches and not overlapping with these. There is only one guy whom I have to do the fan out. Worst case scenario. Okay. I can keep on doing this. N3 minus 1 are occupied, N3 minus 1. So I take only F inputs, only those switches where I need to do the F fan outs, F switches. So how many of these middle stress switches will be occupied? f into n3 minus 1 plus m1 minus 1. I need one extra to whom I can just put this free connection. And since only n3 minus 1 are occupied, each one of them can be connected to this free one. These are all independent, remember. I am taking this one. This one is free, not occupied any one of them. So all the links from all of these fan out, uh, output is a switches is free to that. So I can just route one here and this can do the fan out to all Fs. So only one extra will be required. So you require plus one. So R2 has to be greater than or equal to this for F multicast. Okay. So the condition will turn out to be This. That's what I'm assuming in worst case scenario. Now you can actually look into the your pulse matrix. 
it will become far simpler. Okay. Uh, this is also, I think, known as. Uh, this actually theorem also comes from the graph theory, from where this can be easily derived. This is fine. So next is possibility is that my fan outs are more than R three, worst case scenario. So then in that case, I have to actually have min of f m three minus one plus m one. R3 n3 minus 1 plus m1. R2 has to be greater than this much, minimum of these two, which is obvious because when my fan out becomes more than R3, okay, rest everything is same. So, this will be only smaller than this when f is larger than r 3. So, you do not require more than this, that is upper bound I get for multicast. I think there are better bounds which are possible. As I told you when fan out f is equal to r 3 into n 3, you require actually r 2 has to be very small, r 2 has to be equal to maximum of m 1 and n 3. When f is equal to 1, it is m 1 plus n 3 minus 1 and when I am looking at some other f's, these are nothing but in these two ranges f is equal to 1 and f is equal to the maximum value of r 3 n 3. You are in this two range, your f cannot be anywhere else, f has minimum value 1 and maximum value this. So, all intermediate value will require larger hardware which is obvious and somewhere the optimum happens. This optimum will never be greater than this, which is obvious. This optimum will never be greater than this. So, I have given you a bound on that. So, coming to pulse matrix to actually derive the same thing. So, I can forget this and do the pulse matrix. I think for some of you now by this time, you can figure out what is pulse matrix. So, once I you know the middle stage crossover st stuff. So, I am doing exactly same thing in pulse matrix. What it means you have a row, you have a column, you know how many columns are there R 3 columns 1 to R 3. Okay. Want to set up a connection? So, you have only m 3 minus 1 symbols this guy is going to have one output free, remaining are all occupied. So, it has n 3 minus 1 symbols. So, worst case scenario and I want to do f fan out. So, there are f columns only to whom I can connect at worst case, not more than that. So, you will have 1, 2, 3 and some f. In worst case scenario, each one of them will have n 3 minus 1 symbols. So, n 3 minus 1 symbols here, n 3 minus 1 here, n 3 minus 1 here, n 3 minus 1 here, all symbols put together if they are all distinct, which is the worst case scenario. You make some total of them and if your R 2 is more than that, at least one higher than that, you can find out a free symbol which can be placed everywhere because that symbol also has not been used here, has not been used anywhere. So, and a symbol can repeat in multicast scenario only one extra will be required and that is how you get f into n 3 minus 1 plus m 1. Now, there is an alternative approach which is known as coloring of conflict graphs. Rho maximum oh m 1 right right it is m 1 you are right it is m 1. Now, there is an alternative approach, I will just give the idea of the approach, I think and I leave it to you to do the further investigation. Okay. And maybe sometime later I will try to explain this stuff. So, again I will be doing it for first time, so I will kick out something from the syllabus to do this. This is known as coloring of conflict graphs.
So idea is very simple. I am just going to give the idea here, and then when we will move over to slap and duplicate theorem, which is for rearrangeably non-blocking. Okay. Now slap and duplicate theorem again is only for unicast connections, not for multicast. Okay. So similar, I think treatment is required for multicast scenario, even in that case. So in this case, the way it is done, I am just going to take a very simple example. So these are two. Okay, keep it three. So there are four outputs in this case. And I think let me keep it four because all switches then this will be four by four switches. Okay. So what will be the minimum number of required switches in the middle stage for strictly non-blocking? I am not bothered about it as of now. I am looking at the conflict graphs. Okay. I am looking at uh, giving you the philosophy how it is going to work. So pulse matrix also is nothing but a graph theoretic approach. Okay. Because you can see in pulse matrix there are rows and columns and I am putting something. So the middle stage switch is nothing but a link. That is what I am doing. So when I am saying that one is connected to two, I am now looking at an edge. This edge which is defined is the middle stage switch. So I can connect, I can actually say this edge is a, uh, there is a vertical graph inversion which actually can be done. So I can see this edge as a node and this as a Uh, the switches, not uh, not the basically the input, input ports. These are the switch numbers in the input stage. Okay, so for this case, for example, if I set up the connection this way, only this much connection is there. How to set up this graph? So in this case, these are the edges which are there. So one to one, this particular switch, I am passing a route through one. Similarly, when I am passing a route through two. there will be another edge actually here. Now since the edges, uh, nodes are common, I cannot use same color here. I cannot use same color. The number of edges which can emanate is actually equal to the number of input ports which are there and number of output ports which are there. That is the degree of the nodes. You have to ensure when two nodes are sharing something, they have to have hmm? no one to one there is nothing yeah right right it has to one to two and this will be two and this will be three no there is i think is a problem here I am making some mistake somewhere here in this case. Okay, I think let us uh, because multicast will come back again anyway, so that time I will take care of this. We can skip this particular part. So, when doing multicast, I will come back to this. So, let us move to the, our regular stuff the slap and do good theorem, the next one.
So I think because of the same conditions, it is only true for unicast connections. So in this case, the statement is a three stage cross network is rearrangeably non blocking if and only if R2 is greater than maximum of M1 and M3. That's a condition. And in particular, a symmetric network with M1 is equal to M3 is equal to N is rearrangeably non-blocking if N only if R2 is greater than or equal to N, which actually is nothing but from here. We just put M1 is equal to N3 is equal to N and this is what will be true, written in a different form, that's the only thing. Now we have to prove it actually. This will also tell us how you do the rearrangements. So we will start with the proof. So first condition we have to prove is When establishing a connection between switch A, input state switch A and output switch B, okay. If R2 is greater than or equal to maximum of M1, N3, either. Then there are two conditions which are possible. The first one is a symbol is there not found in row A as well as column B. What it actually implies, these are rows and columns in the pulse matrix. I want to set up a connection between them and I have to prove if this condition is satisfied, either I will get, when I will look into this, look at all the elements here, look at all the elements here, at most there will be R2 elements. I will be able to find out an element which can be put here. That's one possibility, but this may not be true. So if this is not true, then what will happen? So either is this or, or is the next condition. Or says there exists. Now this is important because once I am able to prove this, I can do the rearrangements. This gives that idea. Or, and we have to prove this always happens. This is always true. There exists. a symbol C in row, in row A. Which is not found in column B. And I think remaining stuff I can write here. further, actually it continues from here, okay. 
on that side and a symbol D in column B which is not found in row A. What I actually means is either you will be able to find out element which is not here as well as not here. You can put that. If that is not true, it actually means all elements you take here, all elements you take here, you make a union of all these elements, all elements are consumed. There is no free element. That is what if the free element would have been there after combining these that you would have put here. That is the case 1. Case 2 can only happen if you take all the elements here and all the elements here. Put all of them together in one basket. All elements are consumed. There is no free element which can be put here. And if that happens, you will always find out an element which is missing here, but which is present in the column. So that is what I am saying. There exists a symbol C in the row A. There is existing some symbol C here and this C is not present in column B. And also correspondingly there will be another symbol D which will be existing which is there somewhere in the column but which is not present in the row. You can always that actually means you can always find out a pair you can always find out a pair. Now proof for this is going to be very simple. Once if I am able to prove it I can then as a consequence prove that I can make the rearrangement and new connection can always be set up. So this actually means so now let us go to the proof. So for case 2 R2 symbols must be found, in fact, it should be must, must be found in row and column together if first is not true. And since What is happening? You are having a switch how many of the input ports are busy? M1 minus 1. So, there is one which is available one port and how many symbols are there in total? R2 symbols ok and This actually means uh, because of this condition that only m1 minus 1, this actually means since r2 is greater than m1 minus 1, it has to be r2 is either equal to m1 when m1 is equal to n1. Okay. So, it has to be always greater than m1 minus 1 otherwise the switch itself will be become blocking. Okay. So, for rearrangement non blocking this has to be true. So, once this is true there are at most m1 minus 1 symbols in row A. only m1 minus 1 symbols are there and r2 is greater than this. So, there has to be some symbol which is not present in the row, but when you are combining row and column you are consuming all r2 symbols. So, that symbol should be present in the column. Okay. So, my first statement uh, sorry this first statement uh, this is about symbol d. 
which exist in column B and not found in row A is true. Look at from the output side. They are N3, so N3 minus 1 must be occupied. So 1 is free which you want to connect. Same rationale that R2 is using same principle. I call it using symmetric argument. So this actually, so here you can write there must be a D in column B which is not present in row A. And using symmetric argument, there must be a C in row A which is not present in column B. So one of the two conditions will always be true, we have proven it. A very simple argument gives it. Okay. So once this is there, I can now figure out a rent, what we call rearrangement procedure. If case 1 is true, you can find out an element uh, neither in row and nor in column, place that here and you can set up the connection. If there is some element of that kind exist, I can set up the connection. If that is not true, I can always find out a C and a D pair. Second condition will always be true. Okay, one of the two always has to happen. So first case is straightforward, second case you will find out a pair. Look into this row. Can a D repeat? Can a C be here actually now? I can always find out a C. If in worst case, if C is not there, for example, in this column there is no C. Very nice. I can always replace this C here and D here. C was not there in the column. So I can always use that. I can do the rearrangement. But if I do the C, the two C's cannot be there in a row. So what we will do is we will not do the replacement first. We will find out D. We will search for C here. Okay. We will search for C somewhere. If C is there, if C is not available, my search stops. If I can find out a C, I can find out search in the whole column. Whether there is a D available there somewhere or not. If now you look into this row. Now one of the important thing when you are going to search for this column you cannot find a C here. C cannot repeat in a column, the Paul valid pulse matrix condition, C cannot be here. So you will never come to this column back again. When you have searched, you have come here D, you are searching, you will be searching a new column. This column will be excluded, this column will be excluded. When you search for a D, you cannot search for this row because D was not present here. Okay. And D is already here, so D cannot be there. You cannot come back to any other older searched row, that is not possible actually. Okay. Uh, so now once you come to D and you will again search for C, this column is avoided, this column is avoided, you will find out somewhere here another C. You will search now in this column for a D. Okay. 
you will find out a D, D cannot be here, it is a unicast connection. I am not looking at a multicast scenario, I am looking at a unicast scenario. Okay. So, it means D can, I can, it will not be coming here, I will be doing search somewhere here. And I will keep on doing search and search will stop, that is guaranteed. Every time I am visiting a row or column that is excluded from the search. And maximum rows and columns are, you forget this and this, is R1 plus R3 minus 2. These are the new columns which will be there in rows and columns. Worst case only those many searches will be required. In fact, it will be even lesser than this. I will tell you how that will be done. Okay. So, once this is there and at some point you will stop, you cannot find, well, you have found D, there is no C here. So, you stop at this point. Now, what has to be done? Replace this by C, this by D, this by C, this by D, this by C and put the D here. You can set up a connection, this is a rearrangement. This is a rearrangement which has been done. Uh, now, I think on graph it is fine, but let me show you what on a switch. That is the best way of doing it. Okay. So, are you able to appreciate this? No, not clear. Okay. <laughs> so, conditions are okay, the uh, text thing which I have done, that when R2 is greater than or equal to maximum of M1 and N3, maximum of these two. So, first condition is I should be able to, when this condition is satisfied, I should be able to get an element which is not there in row A and column B. If that is there, I will just put that element in and set up the connection. If that is not true, I can find out uh, two element pair C and D for example here. So, if C is in the row, it will not be in the column and correspondingly D should be in the column and it will not be in the row. Now, why that happens is because uh, R2 symbols must be there taking rows and column together and row cannot contain more than M1 minus 1 symbols. And my condition is it is maximum of M1 and N3. So, there is one additional symbol which is not present there which is D. Now, if you look at the column similarly, column will have N3 minus 1 symbols, but together I am already consuming all R2 symbols and my R2 is again greater than maximum of M1 and N3. So, there has to be a symbol C which is not in the column, but it is in the row. So, I can find out C and D pair. So, I found out this C and D pair. Okay. So, usually is if I what I can do is I can just use replace this C by D because C is not used here. So, I can use that C for this connection. So, whatever connection being done by this D can be now made through a C and I can put a D here to set up the connection between A and B. That is a rearrangement, but the problem is this row itself might be having somewhere another C. So, what will happen to that? That C was already used for that connection. Okay. So, I will replace this by D because D was already used here. So, C certainly has become D has become freed. D has been freed up by assigning this connection to C. Okay. So, I can do this, but then there can be a D here. So, I am now starting swapping the connections, I am doing rearrangements, I can keep on doing it till I stop. And I have proven that every time when I am going, I am trying to find out a corresponding element. So, if I am here C, in the row I am searching for a D, if there is a D, I am in the column searching for a C, I am always going to a new row or new column. So, in worst case, I will require these many searches. How we get this? Okay, uh, let me do it again. So, 
at least till this point you agree C and D pair. Okay. So, uh, what we have to do is I have to just use this put a C here and put D here that would have made the rearrangement, but I cannot do that all the time. I can only use C here if it has already not been used in this corresponding row. C can only be placed, D can only be replaced by C if C has not been used there. So, I will search for the C if it has been used. I have to take care of that C first because C cannot happen twice. It has to only happen once. If the C would not have been there in this row, I just life would have been very simple C here and D here, but that is not happening. So, it, the D is here, so I will search for C. I will first of all have to handle this C. So, what I can do is I can now search for the column, find out if there is another D. So, what I will do is I will replace this C by a D, this by C, and I can then put a D here and this by a C, because then in this case this row should not have another C. So, best is you actually now search for all these cross elements. D you will search for a C, you will never visit this particular column, this is excluded. C cannot happen twice in a column. Okay. I am now visiting this particular column, when I am now searching for a row, I cannot visit this row because D was not present here. I cannot visit this row because D is already there. I will be visiting some other row, say here. Okay. I will search for a C, I cannot come here, I cannot come here, this is already having a C. So, I might be getting somewhere here for example, a C. I will now search, I will keep on doing it. How many times? Every time I am ending up in either a new row or new column. I cannot revisit the older rows or in older columns. In fact, uh, somebody who is smart enough will figure out this is incorrect by this time. No. <laughs> I will yeah, actually, okay. You will think what will be the correct value. This is not the correct value. You think, you, I, will, I will come back to this. This value is not correct. Okay, this value is not correct. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, I will write you think how this comes. Okay. In fact, this is also incorrect. There is still better value. <laughs> but anyway, at least you should be able to get from here to here. I am only doing searching in the one chain, I am actually searching a chain remember, I am doing a chain search. Okay. And chain will finish when either either way I will complete all rows or all columns. So, whichever is the minimum, I will do only those many. So, that is why 2 into 1 row, 1 column, 1 row, 1 column, that is how I am doing the search. If number of rows are less, I will finish first. So, I am taking minimum of those two and multiplied by 2. This will actually become equal to this when R1 is equal to R3, symmetric case. But actually this should be modified to this. But this also is an incorrect result. Will you multiplying it? Will you multiplying it? No. I got this. So, only one row has been done. When I am coming here, I am searching a column, not the row. So, two elements have been done in one, one row. Then I am doing next row, two elements have been done in this row. So, when you look at the number of rows, every time two has been searched, two elements. If the number of rows are less, I will finish up the rows, all the rows, then I will stop. This one is not included. Okay. And there is a final one which also, also will not be included actually, somewhere you will stop. So, it will become minus 2 because of that. So, idea here is one row, one column, sorry number of rows, number of columns, minus 2, one is this and one is this.
but I think more exact value will be this. Okay, but I, let me come back to uh, how you will do the rearrangements. Search the chain, chain will stop at some point, replace all C's by D and all D's by C in the chain. Your D will get freed up and put that here to set up the connection. Okay. Now regarding how you will do number of searches which are required, this is known as Paul's theorem. So everything becomes a theorem here and it's an argument which is the proof or you can write it formally, it does not matter. So I will use two colors here to actually identify. Now what we will do is we will do slightly something smarter. So there is a D here. What I will do is I will start with D and find out if there is a C. I could find out a C. Now I won't search here. I will search here. Find out a D. I got a D. Alternately I am extending the chains. Once this, then this, then this, then this. So next I will find out a D. Now I cannot visit this particular column uh, row. It has to be something else. So it is here. Okay. Then this will find out a C. Can I visit this column? No. Then I will search for a C. I cannot visit this column. I cannot visit this. I will be visiting somewhere here. here. Okay. So now I am trying to cover up when I will stop. If R1 is less, R1 or R3. So if R1 is less, I will stop at R3 minus 1 searches. Okay. So what I will require is minimum of R1, R3 minus 1. This is the exact value and that is what is simply the Paul's theorem. Paul's theorem is says that if that condition is satisfied you will require only these many at most these many rearrangements to set up a connection. So you have come from here to here and here to here. But this comes from a double chain search, alternative search. So one of the chain will finish first. In worst case scenario, this will be doing only these many changes will be required, rearrangements. This is known as Paul's theorem in the text. And the previous one was known as a Slepin Dewitt theorem. That's a part of Slepin Dewitt theorem. Double chain is of Paul's theorem. Double this chain is Paul's theorem, that's his invention. So I think this finishes up with the, the slip and Dewey theorem and Paul theorem and the next lecture we will now go to recursive construction of rearrangement non-blocking switches, closed network as well as strictly non-blocking closed network both. And we will try to estimate what is known as cross point complexity of recursively constructed switches which will be better than uh, O n raised power 3 by 2. So that is the best which we got to a, for a closed thing if you remember earlier. So you will get something better than this actually by recursive construction. So that is the part which I will be covering in the next lecture.